This video is on tools to improve work-life balance. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about this at a high level, but then give two very specific protocols, both of which are supported by the scientific literature that I think can help you to find a better balance, work-life harmony, work-life happiness, whatever you wanna call it. So let's get into it. You know, there was a story from a famous military general. I think his name was like Otto von Bismarck or something like that, I've looked it up. And he told this story, he said, there are really four types of soldiers. First, there are the dumb and lazy ones. <laughs> but you may think, oh, we gotta get rid of them, they're terrible. Say, no, 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 leave them be, they do no harm. <laughs> then there are the smart and hardworking soldiers. They make tremendous middle managers. You know, they'll work on things, they'll be productive, they'll be effective, that they're great. Then there are the dumb but hardworking ones. They are a menace. They must be removed immediately. They run around producing all sorts of trivial, unimportant work, making other work for other people to do, more work for themselves that doesn't actually align with the objectives of the organization. And then he says, there are the very smart but lazy ones, and they are suited for the highest office. And this is the idea that there's really um, more to productivity than just working harder, more from more, right? Because it's inherent, it's inherently impossible, it's a paradox, that you can keep getting more from more, from more, from more, from more, right? Because even if you work 50 hours a week and then you work 60 hours a week and you maxed out your productivity at 60 hours a week and you work 80 hours a week, eventually you're gonna get to a place where if you're working 100 hours a week, like you just can't physically work anymore. And so there's some inherent paradox there that you have to get more productivity or more effectiveness from more. You have to learn to get more from less. And that's what he means with being smart but lazy. And so this video is how you can implement a couple protocols that will help you improve your work-life balance. And I would argue that they will actually make you more effective and more productive, not just saying, well, I'm gonna do less and just chill. So. Let's get into that. And the first uh, lesson I wanna teach or the tool I use before I get into the two more specific uh, practices is something that I call work-life Kentucky windage. So Kentucky windage is a, theory, it's a military kind of thing. It, what it goes like is this. So you're shooting a rifle and imagine you aim like two inches too high and you, or you said, I'm sorry, you, you shoot at the bullseye and you hit two inches too high, okay? Then you shoot again right at the bullseye, two inches too high. And it keeps happening over and over, you're two inches too high. There's a few things you can do in that place. You can, number one, just keep aiming in the same spot and keep being two inches off. It's what a lot of people do actually, is just do nothing, it's not very effective. The second thing you can do is you imagine you can like re disassemble your rifle, clean it all, put it back together, recalibrate the scope and the sights and everything, shoot again and boom, you're still inches too high, too, still two inches too high. Okay, so what do you do? Well, the third option is you can just aim two inches lower, right? Two inches below the bullseye, you shoot, and boom, you hit the bullseye. So that's called Kentucky windage, is when you keep missing, right? You keep missing, but you do it in the same spot, and you just aim a little bit lower, or you aim a little bit to either side. And I would argue that that is actually a very effective protocol for folks who struggle with work-life balance, is that we tend to feel, I believe in our culture, especially if you're kind of a, business type, professional, parent, entrepreneur, whatever, really anything, that there's almost this sense of like, every single day you wake up already in the hole. <laughs> like you, you've got, you're like in a boat that's got like five different holes and you're just slapping covers on all of them as fast as you can, trying to plug different ones, but there's still water coming in, right? It's like, you're in this hole of like debt and you're trying to like claw your way out of it by the end of the day. And I at least sometimes still almost feel like if I don't like, you know, achieve a certain amount of things off my to-do list, even if I do a bunch of stuff, it's like today was a useless day and I failed. And so there's kind of this like anxiety that we feel like we're never quite on top of things, right? That there's kind of this huge hole to climb out of, this huge water to get out of the boat and we never quite get there. And so what I would suggest with Work Life Kentucky Windage is instead of aiming for like 100 out of 100 max productivity, is just aim a little bit lower. Aim a little bit lower. And I'll tell you a story about this. My senior year of college, I did this like in a big way. I was like, look, I want to work like 20 hours a week. Like I want to basically do nothing. Like I'm going to try to have like half my time is just empty so that I can chill out and be a college kid. And what I ended up doing that semester 
is I taught the first ever course on happiness at the University of Alabama. I won a light bulb research grant. I got my course featured in an international conference. I ended up landing a full-time job. And I think I still had a perfect GPA. So I don't share all of that to brag. I share it because what happened is I aimed for like 50% and guess what happened? I ended up having like 35, 40 hours a week usually of productive time. I still got all my stuff done. It's just this idea that my rifle, my Kentucky windage, like I always aim like right here and hit like 40% higher. If I say, yeah, I'm gonna do like a really solid intense work week this week, like 40 hours, I will end up doing 50. My rifle always hits a little high. And so when I aimed lower, I kind of ended up in the sweet spot. So I would challenge you to reflect on what your sort of variance is. Do you all, and I'm guessing if you're watching this video, you're the type that often aims, you know, right there, like right in the sweet spot and you overdo it a little bit. You overdo it a little bit. You run a little too hot. So the first practice that you may try is just aiming lower. And that's not to say you gotta do nothing. It's just what I call having some slack or some margin. Say so I'm gonna aim for 80% knowing that I'll probably end up filling it and being at like 110%. It's that idea of Kentucky windage that if you're always overdoing it a little, you're always a little bit out of balance. Sometimes what you have to do is just aim a little bit lower. So I encourage you to try work-life Kentucky windage, but I have two specific protocols that I think you can use regardless of that that will help you out that I teach in all my events, all my seminars to military business leaders. And they kind of go hand in hand. There's the power hour and the sacred hour. And what you have to understand before we get into this is that not all time, not all work, not all inputs are created equal. In fact, there's a Pareto principle, the 80-20 rule, you've maybe heard of that, that states that oftentimes 80% of inputs lead, or excuse me, 20% of inputs lead to about 80% of outputs. And so think about it like this. You can think about this for productivity, but also for like happiness and the life part of work-life balance. If I just say, hey, you can take a half day this week, fully paid, whatever, don't have to worry about work. Would you rather take it uh, Tuesday from 8 a.m. to noon or Friday from 1 p.m. to 5 p.m.? It's like, yeah, obviously Friday. Well, why is that? Well, not all times created equal. There's a, more fun stuff you can do to bridge into the weekend and everyone's hanging out and all that stuff. Whereas like Tuesday morning, what the hell are you going to do alone? Like you go for a walk and eat breakfast. So we see that not all time is created equal. And at the same time, if you were to think about your work, I would imagine that you can think of a handful of key activities that if you did them very consistently, they would account for the majority of your responsibilities. And in fact, we see this pattern everywhere. So when we look at even my work in the military, I know that 20% uh, ish of their recruiters generate 80% of new recruits. I know that in the businesses I work with, most of the time, 20% of their clients or 20% of their services account for 80% of their revenue. And you'll probably see this in other areas. You know, if you look at cities, for instance, about 1% of cities accounts for 95% of the population. If you think about your clothing, probably 10 to 20% of your wardrobe is stuff that you wear 80% of the time and the other stuff doesn't get used so much. So it doesn't always have to be 80, 20. It doesn't always have to add to be 100, right? It's just the idea that a small amount of inputs lead to a disproportionate number of outputs. And so when you think about applying that, that sets us up to talk about the power hour and the sacred hour. So let's explore the power hour. This means basically protecting a little bit of time each day or each week for important but not necessarily urgent things. These are the things that often get crowded out by other priorities. We're running around, we're putting out fires. You ever feel like you have, you go into your day with like, I got like one thing I wanna do today, really important. And then at like 3 p.m. you're like finishing checking your email and you're like, what the hell just happened today? I didn't even start on that thing. Happens to me all the time. So what this principle is saying is, I'll give you a little bit of the research background and then we'll walk through setting it up is that first we have to understand that there are really maybe two to three peak periods in a given day where you have an optimally high level of focus. I find that I really have like one, it's really for me from like 9.30 to 12.30-ish. Some people have a couple and technically in the literature there's really three potential times, but it's the idea that most of the time we have one sort of window where we know you're at your peak for focus, performance, for cognitive performance, et cetera. And so, 
what you want to think about is first, when is that time for you? So now some of the research literature, I can, I'll put a link down below, suggests that the optimal times for the highest amount of focus or motivation are about 30 minutes after waking, three hours after waking, and 11 hours after waking. So you can imagine if you get up at 7 a.m., that would be 7.30, 10 a.m., and about 6 p.m. I don't feel it so much at the 6 p.m. one, but definitely those first two, like early in the morning, uh, I agree with. So that's the first thing is try to think about when is your kind of peak focus, maybe one to two, maybe three hours, and really keep that, that range in your mind. And the second thing you have to understand is actually, it's interesting how in the literature they distinguish between interruptions and distractions. So interruptions are things that kind of pull at your attention, but then you have to start working on them. Whereas distractions are things that pull at your attention, but then you ignore them. But in either case, what we find from, again, I'll put a link to this other study down below, 57%, 57% of work environments have frequent interruption and distraction. And what's more, it takes on average an estimate of about 23 minutes to recover from an interruption or a distraction. So again, if something comes in and you have to check your phone or you're trying to write and work on something important and someone knocks on your door and says, hey, can I talk to you for a second? After you redirect your attention back to the task at hand, often it takes about 23 minutes to drop back into the level of focus that you're at before. So you can imagine the toll that takes on your productivity, especially considering that about 57% of us spend time where we're frequently in environments with interruptions and distractions. Final piece of literature, and then we'll put these all together. It's called an implementation intention. Again, I'll put a study down below. But what this means is that simply by stating when, where, and often for how long we will do a certain task, it dramatically improves or increases our compliance rate. So the study they looked at with this was about a certain medical thing that you're supposed to do. It was like physical therapy to recover from a surgery. And they had people, they would tell people, hey, this is really important. If you wanna be able to like walk again and be healthy, you gotta do your PT exercises. The second group, they would tell them, hey, this is really important. You gotta do this if you wanna walk again. And by the way, when and where will you do this this week? And they would maybe say like, oh, well, I'll do it, you know, every other day right after lunch. Okay. The second group, simply by stating when and where they would do it, had like, I think it was like two or three times the compliance rates. And that pattern exists within other studies. And honestly, it's just kind of common sense as well, that when you actually make the intention about when you will do it, you're way more likely to do it consistently. So a lot of times when we say, oh, I'm going to write that book or I'm going to start reading more or I'm going to make progress on this important work project and we don't actually plan out when, where, and for how long we're going to work on it, what we find is it just keeps getting pushed on down the road, right? Doesn't that happen? So when we put this all together, here is the power hour protocol is to first identify what is your maybe one to two, maybe three hours. You could also do this a couple times a week. It doesn't have to be every single day, but let's just say every single day when you're at your peak focus. For me, again, it's probably about 9.30 to 10 a.m. And can you protect some amount of time in that window? It's gonna vary based on your role and responsibilities, but even if it's just one hour, right? That time is yours. Ideally, it'll be two or three, but it's protecting that time so that, remember what I said about the power of distraction and interruption, is that you can set yourself up to be in a area or a cognitive space where there's no distractions, there's no interruptions, there's no text, there's no people coming in. Some of the clients I've worked with on this before even put a sign up on their door that says power hour, you know, urgent inquiries only. Whatever you need to do to create that container for focus so that you're not getting your attention diverted and spending 23 minutes recovering. So you have it at your peak time, you've created that container for optimal focus, and then finally, you have the implementation intention of putting that on your calendar, putting it on your planner, putting it on your schedule, whatever it is that you use to focus on, go back to the very beginning, I said the Pareto, the 80-20. What are the key little inputs that I could use to get to my output? So I'll give a few examples of how this could look. So if your thing is, hey, I want to write a book. Well, what's the Pareto 20% there? Obviously, it is just sitting down to actually write the chapters of the book. And so it may say, okay, well, I work a nine to five job and my peak focus is you know, 10 a.m. So I, there's nothing I can do. Well, that's fine. It's not gonna be a perfect system. So maybe what you do is you go to the office an hour early 
five days a week. And so from eight to nine, that is your power hour. You sit there and you write, you're in a distraction free zone. You're kind of hidden away so people don't see you and distract you, whatever. There's your power hour. It could be, let's think maybe you're a kind of senior manager in a decent sized organization. And maybe you say, well, I think the one or two things that are most important to help me progress in my role that I often don't make time for is uh, developing my reports. So I've got five people that report to me, so developing them. And also just continuing to learn about management and leadership or whatever our job function is because I don't have a lot of time for that. So you say, okay, when's your peak focus? Let's say it's first thing in the morning. So maybe I would challenge you to say you work a nine to five, nine to 11, that is protected time. That is sacred time. You put the hold on your calendar so everyone else can see it. They don't bother you. You spend the first hour of that time learning, continuous improvement, reading about your role, reading about leadership, reading about whatever it is you do. And then the second hour is time spent to develop at least one person on your staff. Okay. Again, there's all kinds of various applications for this. It could even be that you need to spend one hour of your day just dedicated, like get in your email, clean it out, sort it out, process it, and then jump back to your day. It could, it, whatever it is, it is what is the most important thing. Often it's the thing that is important, but not urgent, that keeps getting crowded out and pushed down the road. You do it when you're at your peak focus, you create a container for focus, and you have it on your calendar. Again, ideally a short time every day, but it could also just be, I don't know, like a once a week, I do a three hour writing session or whatever you have to do to fit your life, but that's the power hour. The sacred hour is the life side counterpart. And this is the idea that we're not light, like work-life balance is not like perfect scales like this, where I work exactly 40 hours and then I have exactly 40 hours of time off and then I sleep however much time is left over. It's not a perfect scale. It's really about those priorities and that Pareto analysis that there are certain inputs, just like we said for productivity, there are certain life inputs that have a disproportionate impact on the life variable in the work-life balance equation. It's like the example I gave about the Friday off versus the Tuesday morning. And so the next part of this exercise is think, well, what are those small things that have a disproportionate impact on your life? And what you find is it could be uh, exercise type thing. If I can just get a couple workouts in, it could be one night a week. Uh, I go on a date night with my significant other. It could be church. It could be, you know, one day on the weekend, I just take it fully off. And so I can recover. It could be spending time with someone or a group of people. There's a million different things it could be. But if I were to challenge you to think about, you know, what are your key 20% or what are your small amounts of inputs that lead to a huge effect in your happiness level, what might that be? And you can think about it on a daily or a weekly basis because you can certainly have multiple of these. So what would that be? And so again, what I find with a lot of people I work with is they say maybe it's an hour each day where they're doing something that invests in themselves or in like a very close relationship. And then maybe once a week they have some other thing that's slightly bigger. So I'll give you an example of someone I worked with who he was a full-time police officer also serving in the National Guard. So super, super busy pretty much would work 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. every day. And he said, you know, I think Jackson, there's like a timing thing here around, right around like 5.30, the kids come home, my wife gets home from work, we're all there together, getting together, and like we can eat dinner and all hang out for a little bit. So I said, all right, I cannot wave my magic wand and make you have less work. But what if we did this? What if you made sure you left the office every day at five so that you got home at 5.30, you took one sacred hour to be with your family at dinner time, and then after, at 6.30, you got back on your computer or your phone or whatever, and you did everything else you could virtually. Like, you, you know, checked emails, checked texts, did whatever paperwork you had to do. And he said, okay, I think I can do that. And after a couple of months, he told me like this was an incredibly life-changing thing. Like again, it's not this perfect balance of scale where we, sometimes you have to work more than you should or want to. But by protecting that sacred time, right, he got a disproportionate return from having that time to build his relationships with his wife and with his family. And so same thing, it could be your daily workout, it could be once a week a date night, or you know, once a week I have like a Sunday where I just take the day completely off. Whatever it is for you, follow those same principles. Right? Is create a container for that and create an implementation intention so that you actually follow through on it. That is the sacred hour. So coming out of here, right? You remember I said about work-life Kentucky windage. That is more of a high-level cognitive tool. It's just saying if you consistently 
are missing the mark on work-life balance, you're overdoing it a little bit, overdoing it, overdoing it, overdoing it, wherever you're currently aiming, just aim like 20% lower. But on top of that, you now have two kind of related protocols. It is to think about what would lead to the greatest impact on your productivity and effectiveness, this long-term projects that you wanna work on, whatever it is, and protecting some time to do that each day or each week. And then at the same time, think about, well, what are your life priorities? And you may not be able to get to all of them, but if you can get like the one or two at the very top, and again, use the same protocols to protect that time, make it sacred, and hit it consistently, what you're gonna experience is that even if you're still working more than you want and it's not perfect work-life balance, you have much greater work-life harmony or work-life satisfaction because you're not losing sight of the things that matter most when it comes to the life side of the equation. So putting that all together, coming out of this video, I would encourage you to take a couple minutes to lay out your power hour or your power hours. Same thing, your sacred hour or sacred hours. And I think if you implement these protocols, you will feel much better with respect to work-life balance or as I sometimes say, work-life happiness. So thanks for watching. Here's a video that YouTube suggests you'll like. As always on this channel, you can find videos on both work-life balance, productivity, but also things like meditation, mindfulness, happiness research, pretty much anything that has to do with helping you be at your best in work and life. So thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.